This is my favorite story in all of Scripture. I think it exemplifies more than any other piece of Scripture I've ever read. The grace of our God, the message that Jesus came to give us, and the job that he left us on earth. I just love it. I hope I can do it justice. Will you pray with me? Lord God, among the words that are spoken, we pray that your word will be spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I think a lot about stories. I read a lot of stories. I tell a lot of stories. And I think one of the marks of a good story is that as you grow and age and change and mature, that those really, really good stories you identify with a different character than you did the last time you read it or watched it or heard it. That as your life changes, your perspective changes and and who you relate to in the story As an example, think of that beautiful masterpiece, The Little Mermaid. Anybody heard of The Little Mermaid? When uh, when The Little Mermaid, the real Little Mermaid came out, I was six. And I had so much sympathy for Ariel and her mean daddy who wouldn't let her go off with the prince and change everything about herself so that she could be with him. And her dad wrecked her stuff and just how horrible a King Triton was. He was a tyrant. And now as a parent... I spend 98% of my day trying to keep my children safe. And when I'm not with them, I worry about their safety. It's the thing I think about before I go to sleep. It's the thing I think about when I wake up and I think maybe King Triton, maybe he wasn't so bad. His methods, a little off. But that's the thing about a good story. As you grow and change, you identify with a different character. And this story is one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. And as I've grown and changed, I find myself sympathetic for different characters each time around. I don't know about you. We we have big brother, we have little brother, and we have dad in this story. Big brother, little brother, and dad. You ever felt like big brother? I have in my life. When I think about those moments when my, my siblings got something that I thought that I should get, they got it first. Or they got it instead of me, and I felt entitled to it. I felt like Big Brother, and I feel that anger in my heart that Big Brother had. Or when I stayed behind and did the responsible thing, and I was the reliable one, the dependable one, the one who stayed and stuck it out. Or when I hear stories about my grandfather who drew the short straw and stayed home to tend the farm while the others went to war. I think about Big Brother. And I feel a little self-righteousness crop up in my heart. Or when I think about my early days at TCU, a private university, and I was surrounded, I felt, on all sides by people who grew up with more than me and who had more than me. And I saw some of them squander it and waste it. And that jealousy of Big Brother crept up in my heart. Or when I didn't get invited to that party I thought I should have gotten invited to. And I saw on Facebook all the fun that people had at that party that I didn't get the invitation to. Or it turns out I just got it late and I didn't go because that stubbornness of Big Brother crept up in my heart. And then I think about Little Brother and I sympathize so much with Baby Brother. See, I'm the middle, poor me, middle child. I was a little sister and a big sister. But I think about those times when I relate to little brother. I think about those big dreams and those ideas that I had and the moments I failed and the times I had to come home, hat in hand, and I feel the failure that he must have felt in his heart. Those times I had to turn around and say, I'm sorry, the two hardest words to say in the English language, I'm sorry. And I feel the pain and the humility that he must have felt to come back to dad. I think about opportunities I wasted, money I wasted, and I feel the guilt he must have felt. And once in a while, I think about those stupid choices I made that we will not go into here. (laughs) Stupid choices, and I feel shame, the shame that he must have felt on that road back home. And as I've aged, I think about dad I think about the dad in this story. And as somebody who spent 20 years in youth ministry, I have to tell you, my youth minister's heart gets sad 
when I think about dad in this story. And I think about those babies that we dedicated, that we baptized, that we drove to camp, that we went on all those mission trips with. We watched God move in their lives. We sat next to them when they were called to ministry. We drove the van on the way home and we heard these stories about God's presence that it had never felt more real to them or tangible than it had at church camp down in Athens or Brownwood. And when those babies left the church, I feel the father's heart and the pain that they decided church wasn't for them anymore. I feel the sadness of the dad. Or when our church friends left because we were fighting and they walked away from God and us, I feel the grief of the dad in this story. Or maybe people who've opted out of relationships with the church or with me, not because of anything we did, just because their life changed, I feel the loss of the dad in this story. You know, age and time hasn't just changed my perspective on my favorite story. I think COVID-19 has changed my perspective a little bit on this story. The journey we went through, through the pandemic, the folks who just slipped away from church, that's who I think of when I read this story now. They weren't mad, they just quit coming. But I feel the grief of what they miss because they're not here. And I feel the call more than ever than the other times I've read this story to be the hands and feet of God's welcome to them. Because who, whose hands and feet does God have if not ours? Whose voice does God have if not ours? And so I think I heard three things this week about this story. Looking at this dad, this loving father who just wants his son to come home. Three messages to us in 2023. Number one, we have to watch and we have to look. I don't have grown children, but I will someday. And I can tell you if one of them left or opted out, I would always have one eye and one ear on the horizon, wishing and hoping that they would come back to me. Uh, there would not be a day or a moment that went by when I was not hoping for reunion as a parent of two children. We have to watch church. We have to look. We have to look for those opportunities when somebody cracks the door open, maybe they might want to come back and be among us again. Or somebody who's never been here at all, and they say, tell me about your church. Your church sounds different than the others that I've heard about. What makes it feel different? We have to watch for those opportunities for those open doors, just like that father whose one eye never left the horizon, watching for his son to come back to him. And then we have to run. Now, I haven't been here long enough, but I almost wore my jogging clothes to church today. <laughs> I almost did it. And then I talked myself out of it, and now I wish I had, because we have to be ready to run. We have to have our sneakers on, and we have to be ready to run towards those who turn back toward the church. And we don't have to walk. We have to be in running shape, and we have to sprint towards them. And we have to go with open arms not closed fists. And we have to say, we are so glad you're here. Won't you come back with me? No judgment, no questions. We just have to be ready to run. I'm a very poor runner, but I'm faithful to it, except until I moved to Texas and it's 175 degrees out. We don't even have to be good runners. We just have to be faithful to the task of running towards those that turn back toward God because God doesn't have any hands and feet but ours. And then the last one, we have to celebrate. We have to be ready to throw parties. The church has to get better at throwing parties. One of my mentors who ran a camp and then went back to church work like we have done, I asked him to sit down with me before we left. His name is Phil. I said, Phil, what do I need to know about going from camp ministry back to church ministry and he said the only thing you need to know is to throw parties just throw party after party after party just celebrate he said the church is down on itself universally you just need to be the biggest party thrower in the universe when people think of our church do they think of parties 
Do they think of celebrations? What is Sunday morning if it's not a celebration of what God has done for us, what God will do for us, and what God is doing for us? It's a party. It's supposed to be joy-filled. We have to get good at throwing parties. When those folks come back toward us, we have to watch for them. We have to run to them, and then we have to celebrate. And we don't have to say, where were you? Why did you leave? Where did you go? Why has it taken so long to come back? We just have to throw a party. We just have to throw a party and say, we're so glad you're here. What is the church if not a place to celebrate what God is doing and what God has done and God, what God will do? It's a party. That's why I still go to church. You know, maybe tomorrow I'll feel like little brother. Maybe I'll feel like big brother. Maybe I'll feel like dad. I don't know. That's the beauty of a good story is that it meets us wherever we are in our life and it helps us turn around. Maybe you don't feel like any of the three today, but someday you will. And someday remember that the church is watching out for you. The church is running towards you and the church is going to celebrate when you come back. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this story, one of the best you ever told. Thank you for Jesus who teaches us to live and watch and run and celebrate. Thank you for being the God who always runs to meet us on the road. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.